When every stock is an AI stock, no stock is an AI stock. And everyone is doing AI these days. Today we're going to look at an exciting AI stock, Keras Life Sciences, that's using AI to transform healthcare. Or is it? And if you're overwhelmed by all the AI stocks being thrown in your face by fools out there, then you'll want to watch this because this is how we properly vet whether or not a firm does AI. So this video all started with a YouTube comment from Mike. By the way, our amazing team reads and responds to every single comment on this channel. So Mike talks about how we covered Tempest AI, which we did, and he compares the Keras IPO to Tempest, saying that it's a gold mine for AI predictor development and strong rise in revenues, and he thinks it's a real hidden gem. Well, we immediately would caution anyone from thinking that there's hidden gems out there because the institutional side of the investing world pays very close attention to what's happening. Now, Mike has some subject matter expertise, it appears, in this area. And going forward, this presentation today is not going to focus on technical aspects of the solution. It's going to focus on how investors ought to analyze an IPO that claims it does AI. So right off the bat, we see this first visual in their deck. It says, where molecular science meets artificial intelligence. So Keras was founded in 1996. They've been around for close to 30 years. Why are they deciding to IPO now? So that's the first question I'd have in my mind. So when you start scrolling through their S1, they throw out a lot of numbers. You need to be very careful about how much relevance you put behind numbers like this. You'll see people throw out things like, well, they have 13 quadrillion data points generated. What does that even mean, right? People store data differently. So the only two data points here, I think, worth noting, the 6.5 million total tests they completed, they talk about 580,000 matched molecular and clinical outcomes. So this represents data that you can then start to analyze with AI algorithms. Now, when they talk about their commercial reach, they point to 5,550 oncologists that regularly order their solution. And that definition is anyone who has had four plus orders in the last 12 months. So is using this solution once a quarter impressive? I don't know. But what this tells us is that 20% of all oncologists in the United States have used this company's products. A large majority, nearly all their revenues come from the United States. And when we get down to revenue growth, indeed, it's quite impressive. This is the sort of growth we expect to see. 28% CAGR over six years there and culminating in quite the spectacular year for 2024. Now you'd have questions like, well, is this organic? Is it M&A? What do their growth margins look like. That's an indicator of future profitability. But we want to start by looking at what they're selling here. So some good tidbits appear right away in their S1. They talk about our tissue-based profiling solution accounting for 91% of their revenues in 2023. So this is your focus, right? This is what they do. But that number's declined to 78% last year. So something else is emerging as well. We'll look at that. And they talk about this new assay component for that test. This is what the gentleman had mentioned. And also this Keras Assure. So this was certainly something that I immediately started paying attention to. It's their novel universal blood-based molecular profiling solution. So here we see the difference between these two tests. One analyzes tissues. The other analyzes blood. And when we look at the test growth from this last quarter compared to the same quarter in the year prior, you see the M1 profile test, so that tissue test at 21% growth, and Keras Assure, their blood-based test, that's at 222% growth. So from a test perspective, that's where you'd want to start digging in. That appears to be where a lot of their growth is going to be coming from. And when we look at the massive cancer blood test opportunity, we did this piece here, it's well worth a read. You really have three areas, screening, recurrence, and therapy selection. Now, Keras Assure is supposed to be a versatile liquid biopsy that crosses all these three domains. Now, our theory is simply this, that eventually your toilet is going to analyze your morning visit to the bathroom and tell your smart fridge to make a smoothie to sort out the beginning signs of cancer, the real cure for cancer. We've come to this belief after doing a lot of analysis over the years and just looking at the numbers, it's really early detection. 
right? If you have effective early detection, you should see a significant decrease in cancer treatment, which would include tissue biopsy. So we would argue that early detection is really the biggest opportunity when you're looking at cancer blood tests. Now, are tissue biopsies old news? Well, you can think of foundation medicine. We used to be invested in them back when they were acquired by Roche in 2018. And I asked Grok this because it's something that's been on my mind. Are tissue sample tests going to be made obsolete by cancer blood tests? And Grok says that they're increasingly used together. So some synergistic effects there. That's interesting. The sensitivity for liquid biopsies is improving, it says. And AI-driven analysis is narrowing the gap with tissue tests. The idea being that eventually we we'll might be able to get there. But it says that while the liquid biopsy market is growing faster, that these tissue-based tests aren't going to become obsolete as long as surgical or biopsy procedures are a standard for cancer diagnostics. And when you look at the cancer blood test that Keras offers, you see here they have their Assure Blood-Based Cancer Detection AI. So this idea that this test is much better as a result of using AI. But now we're starting to sort of get away from the real meat of this value proposition, which would be all this rich data. So this diagram here shows you their tissue-based profiling, right? We talked about that, their blood-based profiling, and then this clinical genomic database. And what do AI companies do? Really effective large AI companies? I mean, everyone's using AI. That's not a competitive advantage. Big data is your competitive advantage. It's something else that nobody else has. AI algos are only as good as the big data that you feed them. How much is this firm being paid right now for their big data. So when we look at their revenue segmentation, we see two segments, molecular profiling services, revenues, that would be the tests we talked about, and then pharma research and development services revenue. So when looking at these segments, it appears that any money that's being paid to them by pharma companies to access their data and drive insights from it will come from the pharma research and development services revenue segment. Now this is important. When you look at the breakdown of these two segments over time, there's a couple problems. So first of all, the pharma R&D services revenue segment is declining over time. That's not what you want to see. It represented only 6% of their total revenues last year. I'd like to see it become a much larger component for it to be significant. They said that decrease was mainly driven by reduced research case volume. Doesn't tell us very much. And perhaps what's also equally troubling is that the gross margin for those services fell from 78% to 57%. Now, I love this slide from our Tempest AI presentation, and it points to what puts the AI in Tempest AI. It's their data and services segment. You see that strong growth, close to $250 million in 2024. And look at those gross margins. They've increased in 2024 to 72%. You want to see gross margins increasing over time. Here we can see that happening in their genomics and data and services segment. So Tempest seems to have a very similar value proposition to Keras, except they're much further along. And when you look at the competition, that Tempest describes. They mention Keras under competitors when it comes to their genomic products, along with Foundation, right, also doing tissue. But then when it comes to data and services, their Keras Life Sciences is absent. And perhaps that's because Keras hasn't made that a meaningful chunk of their revenues yet. And when you look at Tempest, one focus that they had was showing investors that they're trying to accelerate their path to profitability. That was by acquiring, I believe, Ambry Genetics. And they said there's a risk that, well, actually, we said this is taken from a piece we wrote about Tempest, an article on our website. There's a risk of dilution or potentially debt being raised until they achieve positive operating cash flows. And when you look at what Keras is doing here, they're burning through a lot of cash. That's to be expected, right? So one might argue they ought to be more mature for as old a company as they are. But nonetheless, they're looking to raise $425 million in an IPO at a $5 billion valuation. And to answer that question, why are they having an IPO? Well, you can see here as of last quarter, they had $32 million on the balance sheet. And now that's about what they would burn through in a single quarter. And they also have around $370 million in debt. 60 million of that is current, meaning that comes due in the next 12 months. So they really need this IPO to survive. Now, you may have heard the old saying, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. So firms that are doing AI properly, they don't need to shout it from the rooftops. The results speak for themselves. We're peak AI right now, which means if you're not doing AI, someone else is. In this case, it's Tempest, which seems to be operating this business model a lot better 
than Claris Life Sciences. So Claris might be worth a look as a test provider, but not as an AI stock, not yet. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave you with this presentation that we did on Tempest, it's quite good. Give that a watch next. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.